I've mentioned before, the results of research that was done back in the early part of the 20th century, observing infants, that what gives infants the greatest happiness is not so much hugging them or giving them pleasant sensations. It's when they realize they can do something and get a result, and they do it again and get the same result. You notice that when they make a noise that they repeat over and over again. It drives you crazy, but they're happy, because they see that they have agency. And that's the beginning of developing a skill. Psychologists have noticed, lots of people, philosophers, the Buddha noticed, that what makes us happy is what we do, and we do it when we do it well. The pleasures that come from the senses, nice sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, don't give us nearly as much happiness as when we've mastered a skill. And it's good to think about this when you think about the Buddha's analysis of suffering. It's the mirror image. He defines suffering, dukkha, stress, pain, as the five clinging aggregates. Now the act of clinging is an action, and the aggregates themselves are actions, even the body. As you say in Pali, rupang, rupati, which means form deforms, feelings feel, perceptions perceive, fabrications fabricate, consciousness cognizes. They're not things. When we talk about them as aggregates, it sounds like they're piles of gravel, but they're actually activities. And the activity itself is suffering, stress. We do these things for the sake of happiness. We cling to them, and yet they cause suffering. In fact, the clinging and the doing is suffering in and of itself, in the same way that the doing of a skill is happy. This is why the discernment that the Buddha taught starts with the words that he taught. He points us to where we can look to understand happiness, where we can look to understand suffering, what we can do to understand how we're creating suffering and how we don't have to. He's teaching a skill. He illustrates his skills with analogies of other people who have skills, cooks who know how to read the sign of their master, as he says. Archers who know how to shoot far distances, shoot in rapid succession, pierce great masses, even train elephants, train horses. What we're doing is all about mastering a skill. So we may hear what the Buddha has to say, and we think it through. The hearing is the discernment that comes from listening, thinking about it, trying to reason it through to see if it makes sense. That's the discernment that comes from thinking. But then there's the discernment that comes from developing, when we actually develop the qualities he talks about. We can read about mindfulness. We can think about how mindfulness works together with ardency, alertness. We can come to certain conclusions. But the actual fact of being mindful and being mindful again, and then learning how to extend your mindfulness, give it a good foundation. Being alert at the same time, being ardent at the same time, how these factors work together. That's a skill you have to develop. And it's in developing this skill that we get in touch with what the Buddha was all about. He left behind the words, but the words are simply pointers. I was reading today someone saying that we can't trust the various Buddhist traditions. We have to depend on historians using the historical critical method to tell us how little we know about what the Buddha had to say and to justify changing the Dharma as we go from one generation to another, saying that the Buddha is beyond our reach. We can't really know what he actually said. All we know is what his 
disciples, generation after generation, said about what he said. But that's not why we're interested in Buddhism. We're interested in Buddhism because it promises an end to suffering. It teaches us a skill. And that skill doesn't change. It's the same skill in the time of the Buddha as it is now. We're told sometimes that we can add new dimensions to the teachings of the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha never talked about social systems and the suffering they caused, but maybe we can add that to the tradition. Well, he obviously saw that there were problems in the social system then, but that wasn't the real problem. The real problem was craving and clinging. Those things are the same now as they were then. And we can recreate that skill. We can master that skill inside us. And if we get the results, that's when we gain contact with what the Buddha found. It's like recovering old skills. They've been doing analysis of Roman concrete. Turns out Roman concrete is pretty amazing. The Pantheon was made out of concrete, and look at it, this huge dome, which hasn't fallen down. If we're made out of the concrete that we usually use now, it would have been dust by now. And so they've learned to recreate the recipe. They analyzed what was in there. They found that the Romans added some unusual things to their concrete to make it so strong. So skills like that can be recovered. We may not be able to recover the Buddha's precise words. You take the sutta and setting the wheel of Dharma in motion. Sometimes it reads as if it were just an outline of what the Buddha had to say. The Buddha mentions the five aggregates, doesn't define what they are in the sutta. And so maybe he actually did define what they were when he, when he said the sutta. So that part is beyond recovery. But the skill is not beyond recovery. That's the part of the Dharma that's deathless. So if you want to know the Buddha, try to master this skill. He talks about how you relate to your breath, something very immediate It's right here in your body. He talks about what you can learn by learning how to breathe, aware of the whole body, learning how to calm the breath, learning how to breathe in ways that give rise to rapture, pleasure. Breathe in ways that allow you to be sensitive to how feelings have an impact on the mind, how your perceptions have an impact on the mind, how you can calm that effect. These are all part of his skill. As you go through the efforts that's required to master a skill, as he says, it basically comes down to commitment and reflection. And then he expands on that when he de defines the four bases for success. The commitment is one, desire. You really want to do it. And so you learn how to focus your desires in such a way that they don't get in the way. All too often it's easy to focus so much on how what we want out of this that we forget to pay careful attention to really wanting to do it right. It's a meticulous job, like those movies of prison breaks. You have to be very careful, step by step by step. You can't rush the steps, but you don't, of course, you don't want to be too slow. So you're meticulous in focusing your desire in the right place, i.e. on the causes. And then you put forth the effort, whatever is required. And then you pay careful attention to what you're doing. This is the beginning of the reflection. It's not that you do and then look. You look while you're doing, and then you look at the results. And the reflection doesn't stop with just looking and being sensitive to what you're doing and the results. This is where the fourth factor comes in, which John Lee translates as circumspection, but it covers all your mental activities. The analyzing, if something goes wrong, okay, what went wrong? And then using your ingenuity to figure out, well, if it's wrong, what would be a better way to try to tackle this? 
and then use your desire again to come up with that ingenious alternative and then to test it through your efforts. These bases for success go around and around and around like this. They hover around your actions so that you do become skillful. And the act of becoming skillful in and of itself is pleasant as you get a better and better sense of how you can breathe and talk to yourself and focus on feelings and perceptions and put things together in a better and better way. You start using these aggregates as a path rather than as an unsuccessful path, because that's why they're clinging to them as suffering, because the clinging is acting on them, using them in ways where you're not really getting the results you want. And that's a sense of frustration. You're putting in the effort and you're not getting the results. That's the suffering. So when you start putting in the effort and you do start getting results, that's the happiness. And it's, it's a happiness that goes deeper than just the, the pleasure of having a com comfortable breath and allowing the comfort to expand. That's part of it. But the sense that you know how to do this, and with time you begin to realize you can do it again and again and again. Like the infant that was making a noise again and again, but now you're doing something that's actually useful. You're exercising your agency, and there's a sense of pleasure that comes with that. There's even greater pleasure that comes when you begin to realize that the things you used to hold on to, you used to cling to, you used to do again and again and again, are totally unnecessary. You don't need them anymore. That's what dispassion is all about. Dispassion gets a bad rap in our society. It sounds dull. But it basically means you learn to outgrow your old bad habits. You used to shoot cocaine, but now you realize you don't have to do it anymore. You can find happiness in a way that's healthy. So you're totally dispassionate for your old addiction. You're free. The Buddha keeps pairing the word dispassion with words for freedom, escape, being unfettered. That's the ultimate skill. And it comes as you get better and better in judging what you're doing, the results you're getting, and what's satisfactory and what's not. So this is how we get to know the Buddha through recreating his skill. He gives the formula. It's just like the people who can make Roman cement again. We can find the path within ourselves. We can find freedom within ourselves. And that's the Dharma that's worth knowing.